Shalom and welcome. You're listening to Temple Talk from the Temple Institute in Jerusalem, Israel. Rabbi Chaim Richman here together with Yitzchak Ruvain today. Twenty first day of the first Adar 5779. It's the 26th of February 2019 in this Shabbat. Parshat Bayakel, the penultimate, second to the last Torah portion, the book of Exodus. The Shabbat is also the first of the four special Sabbaths that precede Passover. It's Shabbat Shkalim. And it's also the Sabbath of the blessing of the new moon, which will occur next week on the 7th and 8th of March. The new moon, that is to say, Rosh Chodesh, the second Adar. Continuation of the joy, it just doesn't stop. All of this incredible joy. That's what Adar is all about. It's about the hidden presence of Hashem amongst us, which of course is what these Torah portions are really all about. And here we are this week, Parshat Vayakel. Moshe assembled the entire assembly of the children of Israel. He didn't do that very often. And um, starts with chapter 35 of the book of Exodus. And, you know, in a in a um, non-leap year, Parshat Vayakel and the next, the final Torah portion of the book of Exodus, Pikude, are always read together. But this year, because it is a leap year, we are reading them separately. This week is Parshat Vayakel, and next week is Parshat Pikude. But we might as well tell you now that next week we are not going to be having uh, a temple talk. Yitzchak Ruven is going to be away on a, in a secret mission away for a few days and so we're not going to have a temple talk next week so therefore we can talk about Parshat Pikude today as well since we won't be talking about it next week and the whole thing is just so amazing you know Moshe came down from from Mount Sinai and uh, that was the first Yom Kippur you know if you, re- you recall when he arranged for um, the forgiveness of the of the people of Israel, and um, that was a Yom Kippur in a way was a direct result of um, the golden calf. And then, the day afterwards, day after Yom Kippur, he assembled the entire nation and he gave them over all of the commandments pertaining to the to the construction of the tabernacle. Now, when we read Parshat Vayakel, it may seem repetitious. But don't forget, we were like a fly on the wall as Hashem was teaching Moshe all of these precepts on Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights, the original 40 days and 40 nights. And um, the the children of Israel haven't heard it yet. So Moshe comes down, he assembles them all, and he gives them over the responsibility of the execution of all of the attributes, details of the Mishkan. But first... He precedes it with the concept of Shabbat. Those are the first verses of our Parsha, where he basically, basically the whole Parsha is two mitzvot. It's Shabbat, Mm -hmm. and it's the Mishkan. Now, over the years, we've talked about this a great deal, how I think we call it the time-space continuum, how the concept of Shabbat and the concept of the tabernacle are very much intertwined. First of all, on a basic halachic level, there's the idea that our sages have a have a direct connection. They maintain a direct connection. They deduce a dir- direct connection between the activities that were you that were involved in the preparation of the tabernacle, and the and those being the same activities which are which we refrain from on Shabbat. Activities of creativity, activities that change the status quo of, of the natural order. Shabbat is all about allowing things to be themselves and not to affect change in, in the way of Hashem's aspect of creation because it's, Shabbat is a reflection of the pristine nature of things at their source, returned to their roots, returned to a, 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 a pristine level of peace. And uh, it's reflection of the of the world to come. And actually, one of the things that I hope that we're going to discuss in our video lesson this week on Parshat Vayakel is another deep level of understanding of the relationship between Shabbat and 
the tabernacle. So any, anyway, like I'm saying, on, the, on one very, very basic level, there's, there's a certain halachic, practical, um, you know, um, connection between the tabernacle and the laws of Shabbat. The laws of Shabbat are extremely complex. Shabbat is the cornerstone of Jewish faith. It's everything. The, the, the idea of Sabbath observance is of, is of paramount importance in our life because it is, it is our ongoing witness protection program. It's because we are, we are constantly serving as witnesses, as, testimony, as testifying to Hashem's uh, vibrant and, and actual relationship with creation, that he continues to create the world every six days and he continues to observe himself to observe Shabbat every, every week as a sign of, the, of intimacy, of, of our relationship with him. But in addition, I just say in addition to the to the level of the of the of the relationship between the laws of the of Shabbat and the tabernacle, there's a whole other level, a whole other deep level, which is that, to put it very very simply, and again, I please tune into the video listen this week because I want to go even further than this. But just for now, for this format of radio, I want to say that the that the what what. The Mishkan with the tabernacle, the Mikdash, the sanctuary, what that is in space, in the realm of, of, the, of the physical world, in the realm of space, in the dimension of space, that's what Shabbat is in time. And that's why we call it space-time continuum, because they are the same concept exactly, but on a parallel level. What do I mean by they're the same concept exa exactly? They're about hollowing out a space in the midst of your... Of your mundanity in the midst of your banality in the midst of your workaday consciousness and sanctifying it hallowing it not not just hollowing it up but hallowing it and stopping where you are physically and stopping where you are in time and remembering Temporally. that there's a god in the world and, and and so i'm just saying on so many levels it's endless the relationship between shabbat and and the sanctuary is um, is an amazing dynamic just as a footnote uh, Moshe mentions the mitzvah of Shabbat before uh, the beginning of the construction of the tabernacle. Uh, the people might have thought this is so important, the tabernacle, and you know, we want to make this this space for God's presence. It's so important that it would supersede Shabbat. And of course, Moshe comes in and and and, and, and repeats basically the commandment of Shabbat so that people understand that's not the case. And so today, uh, when rebuilding the Holy Temple, there's no construction on Shabbat in case anybody were to think that, you know, you have the green light because it's such an important thing. So, and that I think also probably has its expression on the level of the space-time continuum that you want to talk about in, in the video teaching this week. So I won't go there, but uh, it's um, very important that these two realities in time and in space, while they work together, they are on, on, on one level distinct realities as well. You know, before we continue talking about the wonders of, of um, this week's Torah portion and next week's, could I just say something very briefly yet back about in, in last week's Torah portion of Ketisa? Please do. A couple, couple of thoughts, really. One thought that I shared right before Shabbat with, with some people. You know, there's, a, there's an idea here you have to really, um, this is an amazing idea, because it's so simple, and yet it's so profound. It's one of the most simplistically profound things that I've, that I've ever considered, and that is when, when the dust is uh, cleared and settled and the bodies are counted and the whole debacle of the golden calf is, is uh, considered from, Laid every, to rest. From, from every angle, you know? You know, this was a disaster, and it was a disaster of incredible proportions, and it was, and it was so tremendously consuming and devastating. And you know what? And, and like, a, like I mentioned last week in our lesson, it had so, such ramifications and repercussions in every generation. And you know what? The whole thing came about because of a simple misunderstanding. And this is what our sages deduce from the, the words here. When we have in, in verse 1 of chapter 32, the people saw that Moshe had delayed in descending 
the mountain, and the word in Hebrew that's used there is ki boshesh Moshe, which means that he was late, he delayed. But the, but our sages have a tradition that it is a play on words. Comes it's bishesh, in the sixth hour, that Moshe had made up with them in advance that he was going to come down by a certain time. Let's say that it was, let's say that it was, he mentioned the sixth hour. So. He meant that he would come down by the end of the sixth hour, but they were already expecting him at the beginning. In any event, it was a simple error in calculation that they thought that he was late. And because of that, they ended up making the golden calf, which is like the worst blunder in, hi in the history of the Jewish people, until then at least. I mean, since then, we've had some pretty bad ones too, even recently. <laughs> but my point is, goodness, this whole incredible thing that happened happened because he was late. And they freaked out. They were expecting him to come at a certain time, and they miscalculated a simple error of, of, you know, of uh, gosh, you're you're late. I look at my watch. You're not you're not here yet. But no, they were so dependent on him. They were so vulnerable. They they so had the wrong idea about their relationship with him and their relationship with Hashem, and his relationship with Hashem, that they were totally paralyzed without him. They were too dependent on him for things that he that he he wasn't meant to be. We discussed this last week, and because of this simple misunderstanding, disaster happened. And and so the lesson is that you know, it, when something is out of your control, that's what emuna is all about. That's what simple faith in Hashem and pure faith in Hashem is all about, and not just paying the idea of emuna lip service. But when we really have done everything that that is in our power to do and something happens that's not in our control, well, you have to remember that Hashem is the master of the world. Hashem runs the world. You, you, can, you can deal with that. Hashem runs the world. It's not up to you. You're not, you're not in charge here. He doesn't work for you. And, if, and, and deal with what he's giving you, with what he's dealing you. And he's the master of the world. You can't control everything. And this whole, this whole incredible chapter of the, of the golden calf came about because they were not able to deal with the fact that their expectation was not met. And they, they, were, they were, you know, expecting a certain scenario to come about, and that's what they were ready for. And when it didn't, they, were, they, they, they just went postal. What do you, you call it? Ballistic. And this is a tremendously profound and yet the simplest lesson of, of this whole thing. My goodness, the verse says that they were he was delayed. And, and that's why they did this. Is that what you do when someone is delayed? But again, it's very, very deep. It has to do with their, with their unrealistic and, and disproportionate dependency on Moshe and all of that kind of thing. But the main lesson that's amazing here is, you know, because we also freak out when things don't go according to what we thought they would. You know, th what is that line? <laughs> you know the line I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Things don't always go exactly the way you uh, plan. You know what I'm talking yeah. about. Yeah. But the point is, okay, so it didn't. That doesn't mean there's no God in the world. It doesn't mean there's no salvation. It doesn't mean there's no hope for the situation. And, and you need to be made of a little bit stronger stuff that when something doesn't go the way that you expected it exactly. Okay. One other thought that I wanted to share from, mm -hmm. the, from the golden calf, because we could talk about the golden calf for, for a thousand years and never have really touch the surface of it. Never you know, realize the time. There's this idea, right, that we that we speak about a great deal, that there is a that there is a relationship, a connection between the the Egel Hazahav, the golden calf, and the Paraduma, the red heifer mm -hmm. of Numbers 19 fame. And of course, we know the relationship is that the the uh, um, Egel is the is the child of the Para. Mm -hmm. Right, the eagle, the calf, the golden calf, as it were, is the child of a of a cow, of a calf, of a pow, of a of a of a para, of a cow. Right. So the 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 uh, metaphor, the analogy on the spiritual level is that because the red heifer is the universal antidote to impurity, and there's a certain uh, in, amazing concept in in um, the Torah that the impurity of death was introduced into the world through the sin of the golden calf. So the ashes of the red heifer of Numbers 19 are the antidote mm -hmm. to cleanse that impurity. This we all know. We've discussed this many times, right? But the, but the, uh, what, what does it mean, tumat mit, the impurity of death? What is it really all about? What it re really is all about is the, is the, um, 
again, the debilitating feeling that we have, the, the morbidity, the depression that we have when facing death and the, and the false vision that we have, the false illusion that we have, that it's, that it's the end, that it's the end of everything, that it's final, which we don't believe at all because the soul is indestructible, the soul goes on forever, the soul returns to Hashem, it's the body. Look at yourself, Yitzchak. Pinch yourself. Look at your hands. Look at your body. It's not you. You're not, you're not your body. Your body is your body, and you are you. It's two different things altogether. But the whole idea of the, of the obsession of the golden calf was an obsession with physicality. It was the, nece the necessity, in a very scandalous way, for a very specific kind of, of, uh, of material... Um, corpor corpor corporeal... Right. Something with right, an ending. Right, right. Right, and, and, and that in itself is like death. That in itself, that, that is in itself is an illusion. That, that mechitza that you make, that barrier that you make between you and Hashem, which is dependent on something physical, which is dependent on a go-between, on a mediator, on something like that, that in itself introduces the impurity of death because it's false. It's totally false. It's totally the opposite of what the true nature of our, of our essence is, which is spiritual. I would and say that not just the corporeality, but what you mentioned earlier, the idea that Moshe was late, that time itself had come to an end point almost, and the people, he wasn't back yet, so it's over, you know, game over. Let's freak out because... You know, the death is not simply the lack, the, the, the losing of the physical, but it's also the end of our perception of time. And so they erred dramatically, drastically, catastrophically on both those counts. The, on the physical, which is really the space, <laughs> which is the space, uh, uh, what do you say, the time-space? Continuum? Time, continu you know, they, they, they erred on the side of the physicality and they air it on the side of the of temporality of the time right and there you have death and right. the opposite of that is eternal life eternal life Shrina. which Shrina. we which we experience in our lives via shabbat and via the holy temple right exactly yafe beautiful shabbat is a taste of eternal life and the temple is the place of the source of eternal life which is the shechina the divine presence so here we are in Parshat Vayakel again, chapter 35, begins the book of Exodus, and it's the morning after Yom Kippur. Moshe assembles everybody and gives them over all of these commandments. First, Shabbat, and then he begins to tell them about bring, bringing forth a portion, a truma, and getting all these materials together. And of course, our Parsha emphasizes something else that we haven't heard yet. When Moshe, when Hashem was privately with Moshe on Mount Sinai, giving over all of the all of the commandments pertaining, in, you know, in Parshat Truma and Parshat uh, Tetzaveh, and, and the beginning of Kitisa, the, 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 all of the commandments of the Mishkan and the, and the vessels, there's something that he didn't tell him uh, there, but now Moshe is telling is telling the people, and that is the element of the heart. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely, it's absolutely. Um, amazing, outrageous, it's absolutely overwhelming, it's absolutely so noteworthy that nowhere else, nowhere else in the Torah do we find so many times about the performance of these, of, of any mitzvot in the Torah, how much the heart is required. Okay, in Deuteronomy 6, we are, Hashem tells us that we are to love Hashem, you are to love Hashem your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And many times throughout the Torah, the, the, the concept of one's heart is mentioned. But here, my goodness, it's every wise-hearted person among you shall come and make everything that Hashem has commanded. And, for, and before that, of course, take from yourselves a portion for Hashem, everyone whose heart motivates him. And over and over again, we have here in this, in this uh, section in Vayakel, um, those whose heart motivates him, uh, whose heart lifts him literally, the generous of heart, the um, wise of heart. Um, many, 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 many times here in the verses. And that is um, a, a, a very particular requirement of those that are involved with the tabernacle, that it has to come from the heart. And apparently, 
and it doesn't apply to everybody. I mean, it is does apply to everyone. The commandment is for all of Israel. The commandment is is behooves the entire nation. But but uh, and there's one commentary, for example, that explains that um, everyone gave, you know, and everyone participated. But but those whose hearts lift them up and and motivate them, they they gave even more than they than they could, even more than they than they had to, more than they even were able to. But they still gave even more. There's something about wanting to welcome Hashem into the world and being part of the effort to make a place for Him that requires uh, a, you, a person, to walk to the beat of a different drummer. This is not for everybody. This is not for the weak-hearted. This is not for people who don't, who don't feel in their heart. It's not for people whose hearts are full of themselves. The, the descriptions here in the beginning of, of, of Vayakil about the, the repetition so many times of the, of the heart that's the motivating heart, the wise heart, the heart that lifts him. Uh, this, is, this is a very, very specific um, emphasis here on a certain attribute which I think the Torah is teaching us is necessary in order to want to see that we make room for Hashem in this world. Because I guess people who are full of themselves in their own heart, they're, they're not interested in moving over. <laughs> they don't have space for Hashem. But uh, imagine, you know, God conditioned the entire building of the, of the, of the Mishkan Tabernacle on a person's motivation, on the, on the generosity of their heart. And he had mentioned that to Moshe. That was the very beginning of, of, of his commandments concerning building the, the tabernacle. And that was 80 days before God's been on pins and needles for 80 days. Are the people going to step up? Are they going to are they going to be motivated? Well, Do they really want me in the for, world? Fortunately for God, as we're going to be reading in chapter 36, all the wise people came, those performing all the sacred work, each of them from the, his work that they were doing, and they said to Moshe as follows, the people are bringing more than enough for the labor of the work that Hashem has commanded to perform. Everyone responded and how with uh, with tremendous outpouring of all the resources which, which which they got from Hashem anyway, and all their hearts, and so may it be so in our generation as we prepare daily to rebuild the holy temple. More about that to come. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Temple talk. Hello and welcome back to Temple Talk. This is Yitzhak Ruvain with Rabbi Chaim Richman here in Jerusalem, Israel. Today is the 21st day of the month of Adar, 1st Adar, 5779, February 26, 2019. This coming Shabbat, Parashat Vayakhel and Moshe assembled the people. It's also uh, Shabbat, Parashat Shkolim, special Torah reading of Shkolim, which precedes uh, the upcoming Passover holiday, one of the four special readings over the next month that we'll be reading on Shabbat. It's also Shabbat Mavarchin, in which we make a blessing for the upcoming new month of Adar Sheni, the second Adar, which is which is Thursday, Friday. It is Wednesday night, Thursday, Thursday night, Friday. And we have lots of things that we still want to talk about. I just want to say one last thing, Rabbi, maybe not the last thing, but one thing I want to say about um, Vayakhel and about what you said earlier that just be, when Moshe came down from the mountain the second time they had a, a Yom Kippur because God had forgiven the people we saw that uh, in last week's parsha. God had forgiven the people and they had a Yom Kippur and then they began the building of the tabernacle so, it was Yom Kippur that he descended with the second tablets right so this is what I want to say that it's not just a pretty story. They, the people actually, you know, we know when you do tshuva, when you do repentance, uh, you, there's sort of a, a step, a process, uh, and a person can't simply say, I'm sorry I did it. They have to prove that they won't do it again. 
I don't know if I'm stating it with the perfect nuance, but they need to be in that situation again where they erred and this time do the right thing. That's part of the process. So the people, in this case, Moshe was up on the mountain with God for 40 days. They had a horrible error. They, they made the, the, the golden calf. They were forgiven. Moshe went up another 40 days. And this time the people did not, <laughs> did not err. They stayed true. And so they proved themselves. So that was really the resolution. God forgave them, but the resolution of that kapara, of that process of forgiveness, didn't really happen until uh, Yom Kippur, which happened when Moshe came down the second time. And then the nation can, can move forward. That's all I wanted to say. Yep. Yep. That's very beautiful. Okay, very beautiful. So we have uh, Parshat Vayakel, Parshat uh, Day, which is really next week, but as we said, we will not be uh, doing a temple talk next week, so we have the green light to talk about Pekude all we want this week. So Pekude, the word means reckonings, mm -hmm. accounts, accounts really, uh, and it begins in verse 21 of chapter 38. It's the last Torah portion of the book of Exodus, and uh, for the most part, it's basically a... Um, an invoice, uh, or maybe you'd call it a, um, uh, yeah, a packing slip of um, until until chapter forty, that is, um, and it and it is kind of like a verification that all of the materials that were brought forth were used, and that they actually constructed the tabernacle. There's many, there's many levels of meaning. Again, when a person is coming to the Torah with, from, a, from, a, from a, um, a cynical point of view or from a, the point of view of a lack of knowledge, a lack of seeing the big picture, a lack of being connected to the wellspring of Torah tradition and a lack of appreciation of, what, uh, of the timelessness, you know, a person, a person can come and look at something like Parsha Pekudi and say, like, what is this? It just seems so totally repetitious. It just seems like, you know, a checklist that everything was done. But mm -hmm. th so there's a, a number of things that are, uh, that are emphasized by our sages. One of them is the a necessity of proving the, the, total, um, the, the total transparency of, of, of everything here because Moshe was the executor and the executrix and the and the uh, and the, uh, the the one who brought it all together, and lest he, lest he be suspect of anything, lest he mm -hmm. lest lest he be lest he be um, you know um, sus suspected that he that he uh, embezzled or that he or that uh, that, that thing yeah. didn't 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 uh, reach reach its final proper destination. The Torah here, Hashem Himself is testifying, is giving this this uh, accounting that everything was was done properly above board and that and it and it teaches us you know they say that this shows that everyone has to be accountable even someone like moshe and and that kind of thing again that's that's all on a very very simple level which in itself i think is very important but i see so much more in it mm -hmm. i see so much more in the repetition of of um everything from verse 21 of chapter 38 all the way through chapter 39 and everything telling us that they made all of these things that they used all of these materials that they did all of this work I see two things that are very very important one is the emphasis on the physicality of of these items how that how this these physical things were used to make a, pr a place for Hashem it's like the opposite of the golden calf in fact that's probably one of the levels of meaning where mm -hmm. sages tell us that the gold Hashem said Speaking of the relationship between the golden calf and the tabernacle, Hashem said, "Let the gold of the tabernacle come and atone for the gold of the of the golden calf." Mm -hmm. Right. So there's a, there's an idea here that instead of uh, that mistake that they made in terms of a focal point, the idea is to open up your heart and to realize that it's up to us to to make a place for Hashem in this world. Now, so I'm saying the the very physical nature of 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 everything here is like. It's like um, a whole new, a whole new concept to say that we can do such a thing. And the other, the other, I don't know if I'm really driving this through. So I'm hurrying. But in, again, in our part uh, in the video, I hope to emphasize this in 
a little clearer with another, another idea, a twin idea to this that I think is very important is the idea that they actually did it. This is like so amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, y y this is our life's work. You and I, we've been, we've been, we've been um, involved in temple consciousness and in preparing physically, physically, physically for the rebuilding of the Holy Temple. We've been involved in this for 30 years. And uh, daily, day in and day out, we deal with naysayers. We deal with people that are cynical, that are detractors, that say, you can't possibly do this, it doesn't matter, Shah Hashem doesn't want it, they say. They, they try to rewrite the whole Torah, and they say, no, you don't, have to, you don't have to do this, it can't be done, it shouldn't be done, whatever. And then, and then there's a, another t category of naysayers, those who say that it's so holy and it's so above us, like who are we to even try to think about building the temple? It's going to come down from heaven when it's all ready. And you know, we've spoken about that enough, that's for sure. But the idea is, what the Torah is really testifying here to is that they actually did it. It's like, that's all that counts here. It's like the whole Pasha Pikude is basically, it's, it's almost like as, as repetitious as it might seem or as mm -hmm. like, why is Hashem telling us all these details? It's like a love song that yeah. Hashem is yeah, singing to sure. us, saying like, you, you took the gold, you took the silver, you took the copper, you took the materials, and you did this. You made the tunics, you made the head plate, you made the tabernacle. It's like the little, the little train that could. I yeah, knew I, could. I knew I could. It's like here you are. You're in the desert. You ha you don't even have a you don't even have a workhorse. Or <laughs> you don't even have a proper a proper workbench. You don't even have your tools. You're traveling in the desert, and you took these things and you did this for me. And and this is like crying out to our generation. They did it. They, they, they and Hashem was pleased with it. And then no. when we read and then when we read in Vayikra, we read Parshat Shmini, we read about the eighth day, we read about the inauguration, we read about the fire that came down from heaven, and we read about the presence of the Shechina and Rosh Chodesh Nisan, the first day of Nisan is the, the, the day that the Shechina came came into the world. That was that, that was that was initiated by human agency. My goodness, that's what this whole Vayakel Pakuda is all about. It's showing us they did it. Can you believe it? Like, they actually did it. That's what the Torah is coming to tell us here. It's that simple. Don't look for anything more mystical. You mentioned that Hashem is telling us that we actually were able to do it. You mentioned that they didn't have workbenches. They didn't have power tools. They didn't have a place to plug in. But as you mentioned before, they worked from their heart. All their effort was from their heart. And there is a... A, a a parallel or a, between the heart that they put into it and these results that came out. There's there's a, a connection between the energy of the heart that that they poured into it and this list. This list testifies to the fact that that the their heart of the entire nation was was into it. And ultimately, as physical as it is, as physical as the tabernacle slash holy temple is, it is only as real as we've invested our hearts into it. And, and then um, the Parsha ends with the description of, uh, of actually setting up the, the tabernacle and Hashem's uh, glory, as it were, is filling the tabernacle before that in, in, in chapter 39 and in, in verse 42. <laughs> this incredible uh, couple of verses like everything that Hashem commanded Moshe, so did the children of Israel perform all the labor. Moshe saw the entire work, and behold, they had done it as Hashem had commanded. So had they done, and Moshe blessed them. Mm -hmm. And this is this is this so reminiscent of a of a set of earlier verses, um, and that of course is the first three verses of chapter two of the book of Genesis. The verses that we recite every Friday night for, at Kiddush when we sanctify the Shabbat, and it's so similar. Those verses read, the heavens and the earth and all their hosts were finished, and by the seventh day Hashem completed His work which He had done. He had abstained on the seventh day from all His work which He had done, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because on it He abstained from all His work which God created to make. And just as in the Genesis narrative we read about how Hashem saw it, that it was good, and here Moshe saw the entire work, and behold, they had done it as Hashem commanded. And Moshe blessed them. It's like, a, it's like a parallel, and the reason for that is because our sages teach us that when the, when the tabernacle was erected, it was like the completion of heaven and earth. And it, it's like a microcosm of, 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 of the world, and it's parallel. And Hashem was, it's like his dream came true. His dream came true when man welcomed him into the world and made a place for him. And it's like a... Um, a microcosm of the universe. So 
this is what we've been um, leading up to all along. And while the verses you just uh, read from are at the conclusion of the book of, of Shemot Exodus, it's really not the end of, the, of this. It's just the beginning. It's, it's like a Genesis all over. It's just the very beginning. And of course, uh, as we, in another two weeks, when we open up the book of Vayikra Leviticus, we will learn what, what we're to do with what we've created. But uh, it's just the beginning. So, you know, the book of, of Genesis starts at, in the beginning, and the book of Exodus really ends in the beginning. Exactly. Yitzhak, you know, we need to talk a little bit about the Temple Mount. It's yes. been in the news. There's something going on there right now. Yeah. Uh, you know, I had the, um, the um, good fortune, or what should I call it? The um, privilege. The privilege. Honor. <laughs> of um, being on the Temple Mount last Thursday, and I was able to give a, uh, a special um, tour to a, an important... Um, um, anchor from Fox News Channel. His name is Pete Hegseth, and uh, I believe he's a co-host of a, of a program called Fox and Friends. And um, he was uh, in Jerusalem for a few days for a week really filming in different locations. He's working on a documentary for Fox Channel about the history of Jerusalem. Um, seems to be a fellow who's extremely um, on Israel's side, extremely on, in other words, extremely honest <laughs> and extremely um, aware of uh, a lot of the um, the fallacies that are perpetrated and a lot of the lies that are that are directed against Israel, and he he seemed to be very uh, committed to um, um, conveying Israel's side of of the story. So we were on the Temple Mount. And um, he was able to experience firsthand what we as observant, outwardly observant Jews go through on the Temple Mount. He insisted on going up not inco incognito, that, it, that is, he went up without identifying himself, and he didn't get any privileged uh, treatment, and he went up with a group of Jews, and therefore he was subjected to uh, what Jews are subjected to on the Temple Mount. And while we were there, we saw, as eyewitnesses, uh, we, we were able to see what's been going on past week or so at Shahar Achimim, at the Mercy Gate, which has become a flashpoint um, between um, vying Islamic factions and uh, the State of Israel. Mm -hmm. And it's becoming uh, quite uh, unruly there. Yes, the, we refer to the Shahar Achimim, or the Mercy Gate, or sometimes the Golden Gate, when we refer to it, we're not referring to the gate itself, which actually was sealed by Saladin when the when he uh, conquered Jerusalem. We're actually referring to to the the ante room, the building. It's actually a large chamber. There's a, there's a, a chamber there which Israel had sealed up in 2003 because Hamas was uh, because an or, uh, because a Hamas affiliated organization was using it as a as a, basically as an incitement center. Right. And it's been sealed up since then, locked and sealed, and uh, for no, no reason related to any uh, action taken by Israel, uh, the uh, Waqf, Jordanian-controlled Waqf, which recently uh, 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 welcomed some uh, Palestinian Authority Re representatives recently expanded its directory, ranks. Right. They decided to, to go for a power play quite probably because they realize Israel's engaged in elections right now and uh, politicians have other things on their mind and, and uh, probably don't want to uh, uh, get involved in highlighting this kind of conflict. So they're taking advantage of these things and they broke in a few times. Trying to police, create new facts on the, the ground. The police pulled them. They're, they're turning it into a mosque. This has always been their plan to turn the entire Temple Mount into a mosque one way or another by basically... Uh, uh, breaking into every building there. They built underground mosques, and their claim, this is why they refer to the entire Temple Mount as Al-Aqsa, which is actually a mosque on the southwest, southwestern corner of the, of the mount. Anyway, this is, has been their long-term goal, some say in anticipation of, uh, of Trump's plan, the deal of the century, which they already reject in any case, but this will give them more facts on the grounds. And anyway, the police throughout the last week... Uh, pulled them out of there and resealed the building a few times. But on Friday, 
when the Muslims uh, go up to the Temple Mount in large numbers, and the police, I think, are basically invisible, if present at all. They uh, used, took advantage of that and broke in in large numbers and prayed there, and there's been a bit of a stem that the police did arrest uh, a, few, a few tens of people, I believe, including some top Waqf officials, which they later released. Uh, you know, Jordan uh, is, has what it has to say, and basically it's a standoff right now. But I say standoff, but they are still mm. present uh, in this building. And again, they are using this to, uh, to establish the facts on the ground. That area, which anybody who's been up to the Temple Mount knows that in that area there are some very ancient timbers, uh, cedar timbers from the first temple, uh, from Solomon's Temple, which are stored next to that building. I don't know what their fate will be. Uh, and also they're it's a place stored where... They're not there. They're lying neglect, neg neglected there and, and exposed to the elements and it's also basically de de being destroyed. It's also an area where for the past few years uh, Jewish worshipers on the Temple Mount pause there and usually spend two or three minutes uh, saying some words of Torah. Uh, and so this is something that the Muslims resent very much. Uh, you know, they say the Jews are g creating a synagogue there and uh, they're <laughs> praying there. And so that, I think, was part of their motivation for uh, their, their show of force. Sp and speaking of the Temple Mount and various areas on the Temple Mount, I'm pleased to remind everyone that, uh, God willing, soon, in fact, um, in the coming month, I believe, in, during the week of Purim, um, in March, soon, in the second Adar, we are going to be releasing the fifth um, in our series uh, called Mythbusters, in our educational videos featuring animation and special effects, our Mythbusters series uh, about various concepts relating to the Holy Temple. This one is all about the concept of ascending to the Temple Mount in the framework of Jewish law, and it deals with the question of um, how that's done, and according to um, the authentic Torah sources, it demonstrates that in this, in fact, is a positive commandment and has always been um, accepted as such throughout the generations. It's very, very important to us. This chapter of Mythbusters is entitled Ascending the Temple Mount, and it will be released very, very shortly, and you'll be able to see it on YouTube. Rabbi Parshat uh, Shkolim, have you a few words to share with us? This is the first of the, f of the special Torah portions that are read as mafter, as the additional reading, special Sabbaths uh, preceding Passover. This one, we're going to be going back to Kitisa, to the very, very beginning of Kitisa, to read about the half shekel contribution um, for the mafter, the additional reading on this Shabbat. The reason for this is because in the time of the Holy Temple, um, uh, as the, the new month of Adar approaches, an announcement is made throughout the land for the entire congregation to bring forth their annual half shekel contribution to the Holy Temple, which is used by the authorities in the temple to purchase all the communal offerings for the coming year. And uh, it's an important event on the temple calendar, which is still relevant to us today. It's still, still very relevant. And every, every, every uh, person uh, uh, their their contribution was the same, half shekel, whether you were wealthy, whether you were uh, poor, a half shekel, which was affordable by all, and uh, nobody paid more, nobody paid less, and everyone had an equal share by virtue of this uh, in the in the uh, public uh, offerings, which these which the half shekel funded during the time of the temple. You know, it's like next week there's no um, temple talk. Well, I'll miss you personally. I know you'll be away for a few Rabbi. days. And uh, before we run out of time, we have to mention another very, very exciting um, announcement for us here at the Temple Institute. We have a brand new book in English called The Holy Temple in Jerusalem, a beautiful hardcover volume, which um, is probably one of the most um, comprehensive um, English language editions that we have created to this day. It's basically a one volume encyclopedia. It's almost 450 pages, one volume encyclopedia, illustrated lavishly, copiously, with many, many new illustrations and commentaries on the subject of the Holy Temple. And you can read more about it at the um, internet site of the Temple Institute's 
gift shop, and also I think we'll have some announcement about it on the Temple Institute's Facebook page. And website, yes, for sure. In the upcoming days. And um, one other special announcement that I think you want to make, Rabbi. Ah, yes, there's a special announcement that um, I will be um, hosting a series of uh, conferences about the Holy Temple in India in early September. Um, watch for details in the coming months and save the dates. It's the fir within the first two weeks of September 2019. Myself and several other members of the Temple Institute, hopefully it's like Ruvain as well, <laughs> will be in India um, presenting three seminars on the subject of the Holy Temple. Let's have a great vacation. Thank you very much, Rabbi. Even though it's a secret. It's a secret, yes. And thank you all for being with us here on Temple Talk. We'll be back in two weeks. Temple Talk. <laughs>